guys are so awesome. So um, yeah, I'll still have the archive ones, but of course I love when you join me live and I love the questions are the best part of this. You know, I learned so much from you guys. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is I just have to make a plug for my new book, The Antiviral Gut. It comes out November 1st, Tackling Pathogens from the Inside Out, but it's available for pre-order now. I'll have the link in my bio on Instagram, but it's on the website on gutless.com or robinshotcan.com. And, you know, the thing I most love doing is just interacting with people in this sort of very open and honest and um, bi-directional way where I'm giving you information and you're giving me information and we're having a dialogue and it's free. And I'm really committed to doing that. You know, on my website, there are no ads, like there's no selling of anybody's name. And I feel very strongly about this free information, but I also do have to make a living. And one of the way I do that is by writing and selling books. And I have to say, I, this is book number four. I am super proud of this book. I, I worked hard on it. It took me almost two years to write and it has really great practical information in there, including part three of the book, which is the antiviral gut plan. And listen, so much of this is just common sense, right? It makes sense. I mean, that's the topic we're going to be diving into today, that if your gut is healthy, it informs your immune system and what's that communication. But I think there's still things that people don't necessarily fully understand or aren't fully um, exploiting in terms of how to create a healthy gut. And so while the book is somewhat specific to viral illnesses, I think the broader message is just increasing our resiliency to disease, to infection, to all these things that, that can be threatening to our health. So those are two orders of business. You have until the end of September to get out to Instagram, follow me at Gut Bliss. We're gonna be changing that to at Robin Chuckham, but for now it's just at Gut Bliss, you'll find me there. And um, again, I don't love that platform the way I like Zoom and regular stuff, but, but it is really easy. I was really surprised I did an Instagram live last week and I'm like, oh, this is really easy. <laughs> this is not complicated. So, um, and maybe you like me have a 17 year old at home who knows all things social media and can provide a little instruction. Okay, so with that, let's get started on today's topic, which is the link between increased intestinal permeability, which is a technical term for leaky gut, and increased susceptibility to viruses and other pathogens. So I think it's really important to start with just a definition, right? And what I want you to know is that leaky gut is really a mechanism rather than a diagnosis in and of itself, right? So when we talk about leaky gut, we're talking about an increase in the intestinal permeability. So what does that mean? And I apologize to those of you who join me frequently and who know this stuff inside out and who could probably write your own books about gut health. But for the sake of people where this may not be as familiar, I want to explain again that the gut lining is like a fishing net and it has little holes in it. And those holes are designed, it's what we call a selective barrier, just like a strainer, right? A strainer has very small holes designed to let the liquid through and allow the solid residue to stay in the strainer. And so the intestinal membrane is very similar. It's a selective barrier. It means that the macronutrients in the food have to be broken down to a particular small size, the fat, the protein, the carbohydrates, to be able to go through that barrier. And that's important because incompletely digested food can be a trigger to our immune system. So it's important that the food particles are broken down into these small nutrient um, pieces that can pass through the net and then can be distributed to the different cells in the body as food. Similarly, it's bi-directional. That intestinal lining also allows waste matter from the cells. You know, when the cells are busy doing their business, they're producing waste matter, metabolic products, etc. And that waste is carried uh, it, in various vehicles, bloodstream, lymphatics, etc. And it goes out through the gut lining into the lumen where then it gets transported from north to south and it comes out as feces. So it's bi-directional and it's highly selective. And that selectivity is very dependent on the integrity of the gut lining. So if you have big holes in the lining, it's gonna allow things to come through that normally wouldn't be able to come through. What kinds of things? Poorly digested food particles that aren't fully broken down. And those things can lead to food sensitivities and can trigger food sensitivities toxins, pathogens, like viruses, things that normally would be kept out of the body. And I say out of the body because that's one of the most important aspects of 
this whole concept of uh, intestinal permeability is to remember that when things are in the gut lumen, you eat something, gets broken down and into small pieces, and it's traveling down through the gut, this 30 foot digestive superhighway that goes from your mouth to your anus. While the food, the bacteria, the toxins, etc., are in your digestive tract, in the gut. They are not actually inside your body. They're in this hollow tube that runs the entire length of your torso and is really in, it's open to the environment. It's in communication with the environment. And so the gut membrane, when things cross through that membrane and get into the bloodstream, transport it to the cells of the body, that's how things get inside the body. So again, I want you to remember that when something is in the gut, it's not actually in the body. It's hollow. It's in this hollow uh, tube. I just got a text from my husband saying that he got a notification from Xfinity that they've completed work in the area, but we're already doing this on the phone. So we'll just stick with that. But that's good. That means I now have internet again. So, so things are not, again, they're not inside the body and the gut membrane allows things to pass through. So you see that this thin intestinal lining that is one cell thick, and so we call it the gut lining, the intestinal epithelial barrier, the intestinal lining, I'm talking about the same thing, this fishing net. It is one cell thick, and it is literally the only thing that is protecting you from the environment, from all the gazillions of microbes you swallow, from you know the time I ate the greens, from my dad's garden that he had forgotten that he sprayed with dare repellent, that I got poisoned with, the gut lining is protecting you from all of that, right? So it is critically important that we have a healthy gut lining. So let's start with the things that can hurt that gut lining. And then we're going to talk about how that translates then into your susceptibility to viral illnesses. So Let's start with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. If when I think about the things that damage gut lining, I, for organizational purposes, like to divide that up into five main areas. So diet is a big one. Medications are another one. Infection is another one. Stress is another one. And inflammation is a fifth, right? Now there are other things, but those are the big categories. So I hope I can remember them in that order, but let's start with diet. So this does not come as a surprise. So highly processed foods, most of you probably saw that recent article and it was on CNN, it was in everybody's feed about highly processed foods being linked to colon cancer. And that study was particularly looking at colon cancer in men, but of course the same thing applies to women and other populations. And that's because highly processed foods often have things in them, emulsifiers, fillers, chemicals to make them shelf stable. You know, food isn't supposed to sit on a shelf for two years and not go bad. So these foods have things in them that are damaging to the gut lining. And that's why they're associated with inflammation. And now, as it turns out with cancer, in some of these instances, because some of these substances actually harm the gut bacteria and the gut lining. And these are two processes that are very involved with keeping us healthy. So a highly processed, high refined sugar, high fat diet can be damaging to the gut lining. Large amounts of alcohol. Remember alcohol is, you know, is, is toxic to our bodies and to our gut microbes and to our gut lining in large amounts. And the amount will vary, but the general rule of thumb I like to use from a lot of the large studies looking at the likelihood of developing cancer from alcohol, alcohol is a risk factor for cancer, really keeps that to less than one drink a day, okay? So that's less than seven drinks a week, six. And ideally not six in one day, um, kind of spread out, maybe one a day, maybe two some days and then another, two another day, one another. But you really want to keep that number six in mind, six or fewer, okay? for alcohol. So this high fat, high sugar, highly processed diet, plus or minus, you know, large amounts of alcohol defined by more than one drink a day, cumulative per week, can damage the gut lining. That's diet. What about medications? You know, the medicine cabinet is a place, it's one of the first places I go with patients, especially a new patient who comes in with complaints. I want to know, what are you taking? Because unfortunately, so often, something that you're taking may be helping one thing, 
but causing problems in another area. And non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are exactly one of those drugs that are incredibly helpful for analgesia, particularly if the pain you're treating is from inflammation. And those of you who've been with me for a while know I had a very, very eventful beginning of the year, snowboarding accident, cracked tooth, fractured root, emergency extraction, et cetera. And that was a really painful process. And I have to say, because I spend my life helping people avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and heal the damage they've done in their GI tract, I very rarely take these drugs, but I was shocked at how well they worked. I mean, I had throbbing pain from this excavated site where the tooth had shattered and there'd been all kinds of drama. And I would take 800 milligrams of Motrin and it would be like it never happened. Like it was just a bad dream. But at the same time, after a few days of this, I could tell I was developing an ulcer. I was nauseated. I had a little bit of vomiting in yoga class, bending over, and I felt terrible. And so it was very clear to me that the Motrin was really doing a number on my stomach. And what it does, not just in the stomach, but throughout the small intestine, is it can cause, first of all, erosions. And then when those erosions get bigger, ulcers. When I do an endoscopy and I see ulcers in the GI tract, that's literally a hole in the lining that I'm looking at. And if you're unfortunate enough to have that hole happen to develop over a blood vessel, you can have a bleeding ulcer and you can have fatal bleeding from that. So these things are pretty significant and gastrointestinal bleeding as a result of these holes is one of the main, main side effects of these non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So I'm talking about ibuprofen and aspirin preparations. And of course, some NSAIDs are less damaging to the GI tract. I just did a IG post, I think that was my antiviral gut tip of the week last Friday, which was about um, reducing the dosage and using an alternative form of an NSAID that's less, less damaging to the gut lining and also thinking about non-pharmaceutical options like ice, massage, physical therapy, rest, et cetera. So another reason to check out stuff on Instagram because I give some other tips there. So there, yes, there are things you can do, but and there are people who are more susceptible to these effects, but the bottom line is these drugs are very damaging to the gut lining while they are healing inflammation somewhere else in your body, or at least alleviating the discomfort from it, they can be causing inflammation in your gut. So medicine cabinet, that also includes antibiotics. How do antibiotics harm the gut lining? Because they disrupt the microbes that are up against that gut lining and the microbes are also involved in maintaining the integrity. Right, So when you damage the gut microbiome, you can, dysbiosis, that damage and imbalance can also be reflected in an increase in intestinal permeability. And there are other medications too, but we're not going to do an exhaustive list. Acid blockers, I would say the top three would probably be NSAIDs, antibiotics, and acid blockers. Okay, so we did diet, we did medicine cabinet. Um, let's talk about infection. Severe infection. So, for example, certain strains of influenza can also increase intestinal permeability. COVID 19 itself, so it's a two way street, right? Increase intestinal permeability can open up that barrier, make it more permeable to pathogens, but an infection itself can also cause some leakiness of the gut membrane. And there are parasitic infections, fungal infections, bacterial, viral, all of them. Uh, well, not every single one, but certain ones in these different categories have been associated with an increase in intestinal permeability. Then we get to uh, inflammation itself. So if we think about the classic inflammatory digestive conditions, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, those conditions can be associated with an increase in permeability. And I should say celiac disease and go back to diet that even in people who don't have celiac disease, a lot of studies show that gluten, particularly in a very processed form, can also increase intestinal permeability, even in people who don't have celiac disease or aren't aware of being gluten intolerant. So not saying that you should never eat gluten if you don't have any symptoms from it, but it's worth thinking about how much of your diet is consisting of processed products containing wheat, rye, and barley, and trying to keep those to a reasonable amount, even if you don't have symptoms. Okay. So back to inflammation. So these inflammatory conditions, when I do endoscopy or colonoscopy on somebody with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, I can see those actual ulcers. So much like the NSAIDs ulceration, those are inflammatory conditions that lead to ulceration 
in the gut. And that ulceration is associated with this increase in intestinal permeability. Now, somebody with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and I know many of my beloved patients are on this call, and so hello to you guys. And for you with IBD, here's some good news. Remember that if your disease is in remission or well-controlled, then that leakiness is improved also, right? So it's not like you had a diagnosis of Crohn's disease when you were 15, now you're 45 and you still have increased intestinal permeability. This is something that ebbs and flows and that is related to the degree of inflammation. So yet another reason to try and get your disease into a deep remission. And speaking of that, we're gonna be uh, relaunching drug-free IBD this fall. I was gonna do it without the live component, but honestly, I think the live component adds so much both for you guys as participants and for me as a person creating the course to hear the things you're interested in, the questions you have. So um, keep a lookout for that. We'll be sending out some notices in our monthly newsletter on Instagram, on the website, et cetera. And I look forward to joining you for that. So inflammation is another one. So we did diet, we did um, medicine cabinet, we did inflammation, and I want to also, we did infection and then stress is one of the big ones. So we know that stress, particularly chronic stress can increase the amounts of various pathogenic organisms. And in some of these studies, there's a classic study done in college students, it increased the amount of this sort of less desirable bacteria by a thousand fold in an hour. And I think about my college students who are so often having flares of their Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, during exam period, right, when they're super stressed. So this isn't just in your head, it's also in your body and it's very much in your gut. So chronic stress is something that we know can change the microbial composition and can actually lead to a weakening of the junctions between those cells, the tight junctions as they're called, between those intestinal cells. So these are all some of the different things that can affect your gut lining. So I want you to think about that. What are you eating? What's in your medicine cabinet? What does your chronic stress look like? And um, you know, have you had a recent infection, something significant? And what are other inflammatory states in your body that might be going on that you wanna try and get out of control, particularly systemic inflammation? Okay, so that was sort of an exhaustive cover of that. Let me pause and look at what's happening with the questions. Um, uh, Let's see, I think these are, oh how, do, oh, how do steroids affect the gut lining? Thank you for that, Al. Yeah, steroids are also one of those drugs in the medicine cabinet that can increase intestinal permeability. Thanks so much for the reminder. Um, Jean wants to know, does a negative effect of NSAIDs linger after its use is terminated? Generally, no, Jean. We see that after about six to eight weeks, those erosions can heal. So if you're using NSAIDs more sporadically, you may be okay. It's that sort of consistent use that's a problem. Al wants to know, does the route of administration change or impact the effect of steroids on the gut? Well, the higher the dose, Al, the greater the damage. So generally, dosages under five milligrams or less are well tolerated. But once you start to get above 20 milligrams, you know, that's when we worry more. And like the NSAID use, if you're on chronic steroids, that's more deleterious than if you're taking, you know, five days of steroids for poison ivy or something like that. And generally intravenous steroids are, have a more powerful effect than oral, okay? So, and that's the opposite for NSAIDs. NSAIDs that are given orally are more damaging to the gut lining because they have a direct effect on the lining versus intravenous forms or intramuscular forms. But for steroids, the intravenous steroids are quite potent, but oral are a problem too. Topical steroids, if you're using a steroid cream, that doesn't seem to have a significant impact on the gut lining. Okay, what do acid blockers do to the gut? Acid blockers change the pH of the gut, and so they make the upper GI tract more alkali instead of acidic, and that changes the gradient of gut bacteria. It causes perturbations in the microbiome because you're supposed to have an acidic gut higher up, lower levels of bacteria, and then you get more alkali as you get down to the colon, higher levels of bacteria. So it mixes that up and it turns out that chronic use of proton pump inhibitors, acid blockers, has a similar effect to what we see with chronic antibiotics for messing up the microbiome, which then messes up the gut lining. 
Uh, Susan says, I also heard that lack of blood flow also leads to leaky gut, as with arterial compression, such as MALS. Yes, Susan, you're absolutely right. So something called ischemic colitis or low-grade ischemia, we see this in older patients sometimes where the blood vessels sometimes have blockages, the flow isn't quite as good, and there's low levels, the, the blood flow, the vascularity to the digestive tract is decreased. Now, the gut is a very vascular organ. There's a lot of blood supply, inferior mesenteric artery, superior mesenteric artery, the celiac plexus. So when that blood flow is decreased and compromised, that can also affect the gut lining. You guys are so smart. You could write a textbook on digestive health. I'm not kidding. This is fantastic. So Susan, thank you for adding that. Um, Cynthia wants to know, do you see a primary link between NSAIDs and microscopic colitis? Absolutely, Cynthia. NSAIDs are one of the triggers of the condition microscopic colitis, which is to further divided into two conditions, lymphocytic colitis and collagenous colitis, and it can be a trigger, a cause of that. Monica says, what are ways we can improve gut lining? We're going to get to that. Good segue. Okay, so as usual, you guys are just full of great questions. Maybe I should... You know what, let me, uh, I was trying to delete questions, but that's gonna take too long. So I'll just, um, I'll just go down and get more as they come up. Okay, so we've talked about all the different causes. And what I wanna bring this back to is viral illnesses. So when we talk about pathogens getting into our body, remember that we have more ACE2 receptors, the receptors that bind SARS-CoV-2 in our gut than we have in our lungs. And think about how stuff gets into our body. You know, this stuff is aerosolized, it's in droplets, somebody coughs or sneezes on you. It can get in through your airway, but so often it's getting in through our mouth and it gets down into our gut. And if you don't have stomach acid to denature the viral protein, an important defense, um, or even if you do have stomach acid, it can happen. But if you are on an acid blocker and you don't have stomach acid, you're at double the risk. And then the virus, SARS-CoV-2, influenza, et cetera, infects the enterocytes, the intestinal cells, right? And that starts this inflammatory cascade that we see with COVID-19. So if the virus, let's say, gets into the GI tract, it's floating around looking for a way in, not because viruses are terrible organisms, but because like all of us, they're in the business of survival. And remember that a virus on its own is just genetic material, DNA or RNA. And in order for it to come to life, to become animated and replicate, which is the goal, just like us, uh, one of the main reasons that we are here is to reproduce so that the species can survive. Well, same thing with viruses. So they're looking for a little inroad to get in and they will attach to the surface of a cell, those spike proteins, remember, attach to the surface, inject their genetic material into the cell, hijacked that cell's machinery and get it to start reproducing copies of its own little virus, right? Instead of copies of the cell. So that's how that works. And so if you have a lining where those junctions are very loose and the virus is floating around, it, it, can, it might have infected your cells already and you have COVID, but if it can penetrate the gut lining, and remember to penetrate that lining, it needs to swim through a layer of mucus that's equivalent for a viral protocol of a couple football fields. So it's going to get through that sticky mucus matrix that can trap it and expel it. And then it's got to wade through, you know, a couple gazillion <laughs> microbes that are also trying to compete with it for binding sites and do other things to destroy it. And then if it makes it through all of that, then it's got to get through these tight junctions. So if there's a big gap, it's going to be like, aha, I'm going to swim through and get through. And to get back to that link between gut microbes, intestinal lining, and viral illnesses, remember that big study that showed the health of the microbiome is very predictive of outcome after viral illness. And in that study, it showed that high levels of a not so good bacteria, Enterococcus faecalis, is associated with worse prognosis. And that's because Enterococcus faecalis itself is one of those bacteria that can penetrate the gut lining get into the bloodstream, cause problems, and it can bring some SARS-CoV-2 along with it, right? And high levels of the Calibacterium prosnitzii, F. prosnitzii, good bacteria that you cultivate through eating a lot of plant fiber, that bacteria is very strongly associated with a good prognosis. 
lower rates of ICU admission, ventilator, et cetera, and even lower rates of on COVID. So this stuff is important. It matters. Okay. So that's how the virus can penetrate. And then now you don't just have COVID-19 where, you know, you have some respiratory symptoms. Now you potentially have complications in your heart, in your liver, in your lungs, in your, maybe even in your brain, in these more distant organs as a result of the virus penetrating through. And what's really fascinating is that researchers in the 1990s, when our awareness about this sort of leaky gut increase in intestinal permeability was first really being raised, researchers took bacteria in rodents and mice, poor mice, it's so terrible, but at the same time, providing so much incredibly important information for us about human health, right? So they took bacteria from the gut lumen of the mice, like that were floating around in the digestive tract, and they took them and they basically injected them into the wall of the gut lining. They said, okay, all these bacteria floating around in the lumen, what if we put them into the lining, what would happen? They didn't inject them through the wall of the, of the co right, mice colon. They injected them into the wall. So right into that space between the colonocytes. And what happened? Not only did they get inflammation in the gut, but these mice had systemic signs of inflammation in distant organs. They had, you know, they had inflammatory symptoms that would be almost equivalent to a uh, multisystem inflammatory syndrome, MIS, that we see in children and adults with COVID-19. And what's really fascinating is following on from those studies in the 1990s, in 2021, he Nam Kim, a researcher at University of Korea in their laboratory system, he detected antigens to SARS-CoV-2 and viral particles past that gut lining in people who were suffering from this multisystem inflammatory syndrome and also high levels of zonulin, implying that there had been a breach in the gut lining, right? correlating this more severe form of inflammation from SARS-CoV-2 with increased permeability in the gut lining. And, and who is at risk for increased intestinal permeability? The elderly, because the lining breaks down a little bit as we get older, it can. And people with chronic conditions, so having obesity, being diabetic, um, you know, having heart disease, all of these more systemic comorbidities that we see are a risk factor for doing worse with COVID-19 are a risk factor for increased intestinal permeability. And so, you know, we start to see what the mechanisms are, right? So it's not just, here's a diagnosis. It is, this is a mechanism for you to have a worse outcome from these things. And for this main barrier, you know, I think of it as like the gut shield. The stomach acid is one shield. You gotta have that stomach acid so it can kill viruses and pathogenic bacteria. And then another shield is your gut lining. You know, it, it's like leaving your door open to your house. You know, if you have these big holes, things are gonna get through. So these are things that we need to pay attention to. And these are the mechanisms for which we see an increase in morbidity, people not doing well, and mortality, people dying from these things. And I'm not trying to suggest that the gut is the answer to everything and we can make ourselves invincible. Of course we can't but it's critically important to understand how these host defenses work, many of them located in the gut, and what we can do to A, not sabotage them, B, strengthen them so that we can be more resilient human beings. Okay, let's see what else is happening with the questions. Let me keep an eye on the time. You know, I can be long-winded here. Okay, does the root ways in which, okay, so Monica, we're gonna get to your question in just a minute, ways in which we can improve the gut lining. Um, but what I would say is the main way is we can avoid disrupting it, okay? So it's less about sometimes what we're doing and more about what we're not doing. So we need to avoid these behaviors, these medications, this excessive alcohol, this highly processed food, right? And then we'll talk about there's one major thing that we can do, and it's actually not a supplement, to help strengthen the gut barrier. Okay, can leaky gut result itself or heal over time? Absolutely, Jill. So again, if you are doing something like taking NSAIDs every day and you stop doing that, that is going to heal. Somebody said, I just had a 24 hour pH test and manometry done. Doctor said PPI is a treatment Ugh, for the reflux. I've been on a PPI for 16 years. 
I'm sure that my food sensitivity started after I'd been on PPIs. Is Pepsid better than PPI? Absolutely. If you can take Pepsid as needed, you're going to do more, you're going to do less damage. But, but you've got to talk about this with your doctor because as much as I'd love to be your doctor, I'm not your doctor. And so I haven't seen your 24-hour pH and manometry. I don't know the degree of reflux you have either from the testing or from your symptoms or from an endoscopy. I don't know if you have Barrett's esophagus, how severe this is, but I want you to go and talk to your doctor. And I want you to say, listen, doc, I've been on PPIs for 16 years and I've been reading and hearing a lot about how these drugs can increase my susceptibility to viral illness, are not great for my gut. And I would like to know, can I take Pepsid instead of the PPI, okay? Or could you take the PPI every other day? You know, what can you do to lessen the likelihood? And then of course, I want you to pay attention to what you can do to decrease reflux. And that's a past office hours. So go to gutless.com or robinshotcan.com, go to the office hours landing page, look at the archived office hours, find the one on reflux, PPIs, and, and follow some guidelines there. And then there's also good stuff on the blog about that, okay? But you gotta teach your doctor. You know, I, I most of the important stuff I know, I know because fabulous patients like showed me and told me and shared with me, were open with me, and my eyes were opened to what is possible. So I don't want you to just write your doctor off and I want you to be persistent with, with him or her and show them the data, show them that population-based study, 54,000 patients showing that PPI use leads to an increased risk of COVID, right? And get them to come on board so you can be partners on your healthcare journey. Okay. Naomi says, what causes frothy colon and is it a signal of an infection? I'm not sure what you mean by frothy, Naomi. Do you mean mucus in the colon? If you mean mucus in the colon, that can be a sign of the gut lining turning over. And while we can see excessive mucus in things like microscopic colitis and ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, we can also see excessive mucus in a healthy colon just as a way of the colon kind of, you know, maybe trying to get rid of some stuff that it's been trapping, not necessarily pathogens, sometimes just pollen and things like that that are irritating that you swallow. The colon will produce more mucus. Our GI tract produces about one and a half liters of mucus a day. And again, it's meant to trap and expel things. So let's see if you gave me an update on frothy colon. Um, okay, not sure that was a description of mine after colonoscopy. Okay, so now you might want to ask them for a bit more detail what they mean by frothy. It's, you know, I've been a gastroenterologist for 25 years. I've never heard that term. Um, but, you know, people are creative. And so go back and say, what do you mean by frothy? Did you mean there was a lot of mucus in there? The other thing that we can see after the bowel prep is sometimes there are just a lot of bubbles. You know, the bowel prep, depending on what bowel prep you took, sometimes there's cymethicone and other things in there. And that can lead to a lot of, you know, what could look like froth. And so um, get a little more details from them and, and let me know. All right, so how do we, how do we fix this? How do we improve it? And let me remind you, it doesn't have to be perfect, right? Like, it's like aging. We can't fix aging, but we can age in a healthy way. And we wouldn't want to fix aging because the alternative to aging is not aging, which is to be, means being dead, right? I don't want to stop aging, but I want to age in a healthy way. And if you're interested in that, by the way, check out the last office hours, which was all the way back beginning of August because I took a break to go on vacation to Turkey for a couple of weeks um, in August. So go back and look at that um, microbiome and aging um, office hours for that. So again, we don't need to have a perfectly intact gut lining, but we need to have an intact enough gut lining. So the first thing I wanna say is think about that checklist of things. And you know, we definitely have, on the website, and I'm going to be transitioning to robinchatcan.com from gutless.com at the end of the month, but it's on both sites right now. Go to gut guides, and in the gut guides, you'll see the one on leaky gut, and that one has a pretty comprehensive description of what it is, the factors that, um, you know, all the things I talked about, diet, stress, etc. So that's a good place to find it. There's a chapter in my first book, which I happen to have a copy of right here. Um, where is it? Okay, gut bliss. And there's a whole chapter in here uh, called 
under what's gone wrong in your gut. Could your gut be leaking? Chapter 14, which is all about leaky gut. There's a chapter in the antiviral gut called Breach the Leaky Gut. So there's lots of stuff in the books if you want to go really deep. But if you want a more sort of, you know, couple pages overview, go to Gut Guides on the website. And please do subscribe to the monthly Gutless newsletter where you'll you know, I'll tell you about the office hours, etc. Okay. So the most important thing is to not do the things that are causing an increase in the intestinal permeability. That is, should be obvious, right? And again, it doesn't mean you can never drink, but you got to think about your alcohol consumption. It doesn't mean you can never have a, you know, Doritos Dynamito or whatever your guilty pleasure is, but it means that this should not and cannot be part of your regular diet. We save the junk food primarily for long road trips. Like, honestly, every road trip we're going on, and not like cross country, even if like we're driving to Philadelphia, if my daughter has a regatta there, I'm packing up berries and, you know, leftover lentils and rice and, you know, nuts, always a little bit of dark chocolate. And my husband and daughter are like mapping to see where the first stop is, where he's going to buy smart food popcorn and she's going to buy Takis or Dorito Dynamitos or some other edible food like substance that is not actual food. But, you know, it's just part of our like family thing on these car trips. Right. And I will often end up, you know, I'll eat up all my berries and nuts and everything and lentils. They'll pass on that. And then I'll eat some of their junk food on the car trip, right? Because it's just fun. And we're, we're on a car trip, road trip, and I'm having a little bit of that. And I don't think that having a little bit of that occasionally is going to like do any permanent damage to me. Now, if this formed part of a regular part of my diet, that would be different. And when people say, well, how much is okay? Well, it depends on what else you're doing. You know, are you a heavy drinker? Are you not a good vegetable eater? Are you also taking NSAIDs? Do you have a lot of chronic stress that's not controlled, right? So it depends on what the background noise is. But I find that rather than eliminating everything, just really thinking about how you can make this an occasional treat and, and, you know, not have these things be a part of your regular everyday, you know, meal plan is, is the best way to do that. So think about those things. And I gave you these additional resources where you can go deeper on this. And, the, and be careful of some of the stuff out there on Leaky Gut because, you know, these sites where you read and then after a short time, they're selling you a supplement for it. Mm. So, you know, make sure you're getting good scientific information. And, um, you know, if you want to go on PubMed and look at some of the NIH studies, that's always a great thing to do also. So the most important thing, again, is to not do the things that are disrupting the microbiome. The other thing that's super important is to realize that the health of the gut lining depends a lot on these short chain fatty acids, things like butyric acid, propionic acid, et cetera. Short chain fatty acids, and in the book, The Antiviral Gut, I call them short chain superheroes because that's exactly what they are. They are created when gut bacteria ferment and metabolize fiber, indigestible plant fiber, short chain fatty acids like butyrate, are one of the end results. And what they do is they help to maintain the integrity of your gut lining. And that's why eating more fiber is so important. Now, the interesting thing is not only do, short, do bacteria like Fecalobacterium prosnitzii produce short, produce short chain fatty acids, but the short chain fatty acids are also feeding the F. prosnitzii. So it's this incredibly synergistic circle of events, right? Where these healthy bacteria are churning out these short chain fatty acids to protect us. And the short chain fatty acids are in turn feeding these bacteria. You know, in the book, I abbreviated, and you'll see if you read these articles, it's abbreviated as SCFA for short chain fatty acids. So saying short chain fatty acids over and over again is a little bit of a mouthful. But you know, this is, and this is a Goldilocks immune system process I talk about. How do you prevent your immune system from being overactive where you're responding to internal threats like your body's own tissue by having an autoimmune disease? You're responding to your joints by having rheumatoid arthritis or your gut flora by having Crohn's disease or your skin with psoriasis. Your immune system is too active 
responding to internal threats or to external threats like allergens, where you're having seasonal allergies or you're having severe allergic reactions to bee stings. I just did a post on Instagram about the connection between gut health and seasonal allergies, right? And when you realize that 80% of your immune cells are in your gut, they're actually located, you know, along the gut lining there. And so obviously they're interacting with the gut microbes and your gut lining. And then all these, and the gut microbes are acting as air traffic controls for the immune cells, telling them when to react, when not to stand down, get excited, etc. And all of this depends on the integrity of the gut lining. Then you start to see how what's going on in your gut can inform your response to common allergens like ragweed, grasses, mold, pollen, etc. Right. And you want to have that Goldilocks immune system so you're not overreacting, but you're responding appropriately when something needs to be cleared out of your system. And so just as we can relate that to allergens in the environment, we can also relate that to pathogens in the environment like viruses, et cetera. And you know, the thing, the thing that I really love about having these conversations is this stuff is not designed to scare you. There is nothing in this book that is scary. Well, actually I take that back. There is one thing in the book that's scary and it's right there in the introduction. And it is a study from Duke University from 2021 that calculated the likelihood of a pandemic like COVID-19 happening in our lifetime. And they calculated this using, you know, actuarian data as 2% per year, which means that somebody born in 2020 would have a 40% likelihood of having experienced a pandemic like COVID-19 by the time they're 20. And so the whole point of that article was, we shouldn't be surprised by these things. These things are happening. And if we look historically, we see that in the last 50 years, there have been 30 new viruses for which there is no known cure or real treatment. So that would include not just SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses. Of course, coronaviruses are old viruses too, like you know the common cold, et cetera, but newer versions of coronavirus but also things like Ebola, HIV, hepatitis C. These are all new viruses in the sense that, you know, we've only known about them in the last 50 years and we don't have cures for them. We have treatment for some of them. We have antiretrovirals for HIV and for hepatitis C, but we are not able to cure people with these diseases. And the other, so that is maybe the one scary thing in the book is that, these things are coming. They're here and they're coming and they're probably going to get more frequent. And so we need to be prepared. And we've seen that our public health system was not prepared, right? And we're still scrambling to catch up. And so we can't treat these things as like these rare things that, you know, fall out of the sky. We have to understand why they're happening and why they're going to become more frequent. And we have to be prepared. But you know, I also want you to remember that even for really scary viruses, like HIV, 10% of people of European ancestry are fully immune, right? They're never gonna get HIV and many other people get exposed and don't get the virus. If we look at a virus like Ebola, it, Ebola is only able to infect one in three adults it comes into contact with and a, a tiny percentage of children. So there are things in those two out of three people that make them resistant, poliovirus, in 0.5% of people crosses that gut barrier that we've been talking about, gets into the bloodstream, gets to the central nervous system and causes devastating flaccid paralysis. But the, in the other, you know, 99.5%, so in one out of 200 people, it causes this, but in 199 out of 200 people, it causes no symptoms all, at all or very mild symptoms that resolve. And this is not all coincidence. So this is what I want people to know. There are factors from a point of view of host health, meaning us the hosts, what's going on with our health and specifically in our gut that can make us more resilient. And I also want to say, and I say this over and over again, nothing in the statement host health matters implies that we should not be taking care advantage of and following public health guidelines around masking and social distancing, quarantining and vaccinating as you know the as, as public health guidelines suggest, right? So these things are not either or. If you talk about host health as mattering 
and about the fact that we can be in the driver's seat, not the virus. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't get a vaccine or think about these other things, right? These are very much complementary messages. Okay, so I just wanted to put that out. All right, so let us see what else we have, question-wise. Um, okay, let me pick up where I left off. Uh, which was Naomi sharing her frothy colon with us. Oh, the picture shows dripping. That's what, you know, Naomi, remember your colon is secreting, your gastrointestinal tract is secreting liters of digestive juices, helping to digest food, break it down, et cetera. So, you know, and then you also drink a bowel prep that also, you know, is often liquid or creates liquid. So dripping shouldn't be something you worry about, but do ask at your upcoming appointment. Okay. Somebody says I have chronic nonspecific focal gastritis, I think is what the doctor said. Could chronic stress cause this? Does this contribute to leaky gut? So you're talking about gastritis, which means inflammation in the stomach. And nonspecific focal gastritis can be caused by nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. It can be caused by something you've been exposed to either in food or something that's irritating it a medication. So, you know, nonspecific means I can't pinpoint what is causing it, but you should go through with your doctor, you know, what's in your medicine cabinet, what, how do you eat, etc., to see if they can figure out, you know, what, what is causing this focal gastritis. Um, non anti-inflammatory drugs are a big category for that, but what's going on in your stomach doesn't necessarily mean that there is inflammation in the rest of your GI tract. And when I talk about leaky gut, I'm primarily talking about the small intestine and the colon. So you can have something going on just in your stomach that doesn't necessarily affect the rest of your GI tract. But a good question to ask your doctor is, is this gastritis, meaning inflammation of the gastric area of the stomach, is this likely to be happening elsewhere in my intestine? Did you look down into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine? Is it worth doing a video capsule study, a little pill cam that you swallow that takes pictures to see what's going on in the rest of my intestine? And I would say that if you're taking aspirin or some sort of NSAID, to me, that would be high on the list, okay? Um, chronic stress is less likely to cause focal gastritis. Focal means it's like one spot it's more likely to cause more diffuse inflammation. Okay, Carrie, thank you, Carrie, for welcoming me back. Um, and I'm going to do a little photo dump, yeah, for the experience. Cappadocia and the hot air balloon was sort of the highlight. Where and when to buy the new book? Oh, you're so sweet to ask. So Amazon, um, not to make Jeff Bezos more money, but I think that's where so many of us get our stuff. There are buy links to other places, Barnes & Noble, Indie Books, Books A Million, on the website, I'm gonna put a link in my um, link tree in Instagram, but the simplest place would just be on Amazon. And I, I so appreciate it. Um, you know, I really, I want this book to do well because I do feel like the other books were great and they help people improve their digestive health, but this book could potentially help save lives. And that really just gives me a chill and makes me feel so honored to have been able to put the information together. So thank you, Carrie. Okay. Um, Gina steaks in Philly if you eat meat. Okay, thanks for that, Naomi. Okay, so Julie says, I'm curious if increased intestinal permeability can also cause high risk for parasites. Do you know of anyone who's publishing information about gut health and parasitic infections? Um, thank you and feel free to disregard if too off topic. No, Julie, that's not off topic at all. So here's the thing. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and the CDC is not perfect. I definitely will say that, but I also have a lot of faith in the person who's currently running it, Rochelle Walensky, who's a doctor I know, and she's not perfect either, but I think she is, you know, trying to do the best job that she can. I think she's very well-intentioned, and I think that it's an important institution, right, because so many of our institutions, including our academic nonprofit institutions, are very, very heavily pharma-funded, and there's biases. And I think the information at the CDC is pretty well vetted. Do I agree with all of it all the time? No, but I think it's a good place to start. The CDC um, points out that somewhere around 30% of Americans have or will have a parasite. And not all parasites are like, ah, oh, terrible. We need to do something about this. I love that show, Monsters Inside Us. I used to watch that all the time. And those are some of the creepier parasites that you want to do something about. But Again, just like bacteria and viruses, our body, if we have a healthy immune system, can usually deal with these things without, you know, too much of a hullabaloo in the rest of our body. 
but yes, parasitic the, the connection between increased intestinal permeability and parasites is interesting because certain parasitic infections like Giardia and others can over time, especially if this is a chronic infestation, lead to an increase in intestinal permeability. And if you have a sort of messed up microbiome, if you have dysbiosis, if you have an unhealthy gut lining, a parasite that would normally pass through and maybe cause a little diarrheal illness, but you would clear it, that can become a more chronic problem. So there is a link there, but I really wanna caution you, Julie, to make sure you're seeing a reputable parasitic person because there's a lot of websites selling you a lot of foolishness and claiming you have parasites. The symptoms can be very nonspecific. I actually like um, PCL, uh, parasit Parasitology Lab Incorporated. What is this called? I don't know why I'm forgetting it. Um, but it's a parasitology lab in Arizona and they have a branch in Mexico run by a microbiologist. So it's Parasitology Lab Incorporated, I want to say. Um, and they have a pretty good test. It's a comprehensive stool analysis, a CSA, that we use a lot with our patients and it's quite reputable and we're able to diagnose some good things there. And it's much more comprehensive than like lab course panel, right? Which is good for GRD and a couple of basic other things. But here's a problem, Julie. You have a bunch of unreputable labs out there that are finding parasites in everyone and things that are really not significant. And then you have some of the commercial labs that are, are under sensitive, right? So you have too sensitive and not sensitive enough. So um, PCI, Parasit or Parasitology Center Incorporated and their comprehensive stool analysis test, it's under $200. Um, I think it's a good one. And they also have um, a, a remedy that I use in a lot of my patients because I like to avoid the prescription antiparasitics if I can, because they also kill off a lot of healthy bacteria, right? The, um, the alinea and some of these other things. So they are kind of second line therapy for me. So first line therapy, and I have no relationship with this parasitology lab. I don't do anything for them, receive any funding support for them. They're just, I like to highlight organizations that I think are doing good work. They have a Freedom Cleanse Restore protocol that has worked in many of my patients who are dealing with parasites from more benign things like blastocystis hominis to more, um, more troublesome parasites and often with 30 days of that we can get things out of control and it has like psyllium husk black cohosh walnut powder you know oil of oregano things like that but in the appropriate dosages okay um are chocolate and green tea bad for esophagitis and gastritis high quality dark chocolate small amounts you can usually get away with it if you're having symptoms of esophagitis and you know reflux type heartburn symptoms i wouldn't don't eat it late at night or you know eat it earlier in the day and green tea has a lot of caffeine but again a lot of this depends on how you tolerate it and if it's in moderation if you're having a cup of green tea and you're having a little piece of dark chocolate early in the day and it's not bothering you i think it's okay but if you're having three cups of green tea and you're eating a whole bar of chocolate that's not so good Kathleen, um, oh, Kathleen, thank you. Kathleen says, thank you for these wonderful educational office hour sessions. I have and am learning so much from you. Kathleen, thank you so much. And I am learning so much from all of you also. So thank you for that. Okay, Jean wants to know, how is the gut lining affected by laxatives like Miralax or stool softeners or Senna? Yeah, so this is a really important question, Jean. And the issue with Senna is not so much damage to the gut lining. The issue with Senna is that it's habit forming, meaning that it works by stimulating the gut to um, contract, right? And it works really well. I can tell you, I have, you know, my gut is like clockwork, but when we were in Turkey, we were seven hours ahead. Uh, there was so much meat and bread and it was very hard for me to find fresh vegetables to eat. It was not a diet that I am used to. And um, it, you know, I got constipated. I posted about it, how I was in Turkey, but my GI tract was still on DC time. And I never use this stuff, but I did go into a pharmacy in Cappadocia and I got a little Senna and I used it just to get things going. But it's something I'm very cautious about. It's probably the first time in, you know, 10 years I've used Senna because your gut can become reliant on it and dependent. And then you, have a bowel, you can't have a bowel movement without it. Now, that's not going to happen from taking Senna for two days on a 
vacation somewhere, right? But that's not something you want to be part of your everyday bowel regimen because of the possibility of dependency. And there's also data in the literature that shows that long-term center use may also be linked to colon cancer. So um, that is the issue with Senna. With Miralax, which is an osmotic cathartic and something that I use from time to time, and Miralax, again, is okay for short-term use, but there's some data, you know, Miralax is sort of a distant cousin of antifreeze, <laughs> propylene glycol. So these are things that over long periods of time can damage the gut lining. So I'm, I'm always a little concerned when I see kids, especially being put, kids who are eating uh, a, a not so great diet, right? A very processed diet, and lots of meat and potatoes and barely any fruit or vegetables. And then those kids are constipated. And I understand it's challenging to get kids to eat well, right? But then the fix being long-term Miralax, like Miralax may play a role in the short term, but it's vital to try and get some fiber into those kids. It doesn't mean that they're eating kale salads every day, but maybe you make a smoothie for your kid and you throw in some berries and a little bit of spinach with some bananas and fruit and other things and make it taste good for them or you, you, know, you, you bribe them to eat a couple of broccoli florets at night or something. So again, you've got to consider the output in relationship to the input. And for most people, constipation is something that if you fix the input, the output will fix. And speaking of fixing, we're just revising our fantastic comprehensive guide to constipation and bowel regularity, which is one of the freebies on the website. So give us like a day or two, because I we're doing some edits to it and updating it. And then if you go to the robinchuckcan.com site on the homepage, scroll down to the bottom, it's, you know, my free guide. And, and it is, I've been working on it with uh, my chief of operations, Leslie Amberg, over the last week. And, you know, we want to get it like just right. And I have to say, like, it's really good. I put it together a couple of years ago and I haven't looked at it. And I'm like, this is really good. This is really helpful. So it's got, you know, dietary guidelines, guidelines on medication, testing, hydration, all kinds of stuff. So that can be a good resource to try and get off the Miralax long term. Michael wants to know, does H. pylori increase probability of gut lining permeability? H. pylori isn't specifically associated with an increase in intestinal permeability in most people, but the treatment to eradicate it can be because that often involves multiple antibiotics and sometimes multiple doses. Cynthia wants to know two business related questions, not necessarily for the call today, but then I don't actually see the questions. Oh, one, will you be doing any special promos for the purchase of your book? Yes, funny you should ask Cynthia. And I promise you, I did not ask Cynthia to ask that question ahead of time, but one of the other things I'm working on is a first uh, pre-order incentive, which we're going to be announcing next week. And that is a fantastic, very comprehensive meal plan and recipe guide for how to cre create an antiviral gut. And another incentive that we're going to be doing is also um, a live antiviral gut course, which will come out after the book comes out on November 1st. And you, you can sign up for both of them. So thank you for asking that, Cynthia. And... Um, Will, second question, will I be offering any specials for folks that took your beta drug-free IBD course if they repeat the course? You know what, Cynthia, I hadn't planned on it, but that's such a great idea. So yes, we will do that. We'll make sure and put that in the registration. I love that. Like, let's just do a discount, right? Okay. You're so welcome, Julie. Um, oh, Carrie, thank you so much about the conservation resources. Okay. Gosh, it's after one o'clock. I, I literally could spend all day with you. I, you know, we have to have an office hours you know, in-person live session where like we all get together and meet each other. I would love that. But, but I have some homework for you. For those of you who are not on Instagram, I need you to create an Instagram profile. Follow me on Instagram so that we can continue to do these office hours together. And um, buy my book. All right. Bye everyone. Thanks so much. You guys are amazing.